Revelation chapter number 17. We'll begin reading in verse number 8. <clears throat> the beast that thou sawest, now if you'll remember, the woman being mystery Babylon rode upon a beast. This is that beast. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is yet to come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God, who hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now, last week we talked about that woman, we purpose to show you that the woman is not a single religion. It's the idea behind the movements that have always been to make one religion a worldwide religion, a global religion. Got very close all the way back in Noah's day. The devil intended to deceive all mankind into what? Sin. Riotous living to not believe in God. In fact, we know that the day of the Lord, when he shall return to take his church out of here, the rapture, we know that in those days it's going to be like the days of Noah. Right? But yet, Noah was faithful. He and his house. They got on the ark. We know that story. We know that the ark is a picture of Christ. Okay, well, ever since... Satan heard the, he didn't just hear somebody say, he heard God himself tell him that a woman was going to conceive and bear a child that would bruise Satan's head and all he could do was bruise his heel. Ever since that day, the devil has purposed himself to deceive all mankind to where they would not believe the truth, that they would believe a lie. And over the course of mankind's history, there have been many different movements and religions and deities' names have changed. But all of them purposed to do one thing. That was to become a global, world, worldwide religion. And when I mean global, I mean there's no other option. They want to remove all the other options from off the table. Why do you think throughout Israel's history... So many different nations hated them and wished to destroy them. Because as long as God's people existed, there was a reminder that there is a God named Jehovah who does hear, who does see, who is alive, and who has more power than all of their gods. Well, it says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. It says, and go into perdition. That's his history. He was. He isn't. But he's going to be again. He's coming out of the bottomless pit. And in his future is that he goes into perdition. What's that? Damnation. He should be cast into the lake of fire. But it says, and they that dwell upon the earth whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, 
It says, what will they do? They will marvel. They shall wonder. They'll be entranced with that beast. That's the same beast that we read about before called the Antichrist. He was. He is not during John's day. But he's coming back again. Okay, well it says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Again, Mystery Babylon had seven mountains that she sat upon. Each one of those mountains is a head of the beast. The beast has seven heads. If you'll remember, one of them was grievously wounded. To where everybody knew it should have died, but it didn't die. Okay? Those seven heads, being seven mountains, they are seats of power. If you study the history of Israel, here's one thing, this is very unclear. One of those things about eschatology, people think they know what these heads represent. In all truth, all we know is what the Bible tells us. Well, if you study history, there have been seven nations that have held dominion over Israel. Seven empires, if you will, starting with Babylon. Okay, I mean, the Medes and the Persians were in there, then you got the Greeks, and then at this point it was the Romans. Rome was kicked out of town by this group called the Ottomans. Okay, but if you study the empires that have all had dominion over Israel... If you read the word of God, they were all appointed to have dominion over Israel as punishment or of a purging of God's people. Well, do you remember what the tribulation period is called to the Hebrews? It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It is to purge God's people down to those that we read about that receive the mark in their forehead God's mark, the mark of the Lamb, not the mark of the Antichrist. But they are sealed with that mark. Why? Because they're one of the 144,000, 12 out of the 12,000 out of the 12 different tribes of Israel that shall overcome and live through the great tribulation. Well, each one of those seven empires, why did they persecute God's people as God's judgment upon Israel for turning their back upon them? Well, if we study it out, it says there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Well, if you look at the history of those seven empires that ruled over Israel, five of them had come and passed. The sixth one during John's time, if it was Rome, they're around. It says one is. It says, and the seventh cometh and must continue for a short space. Well, there's just one problem with that if you believe that that seventh was the Ottoman Empire. They didn't continue for a short space. When I hear a short space, I think just for a little bit. Well, if you study the Ottoman Empire, anybody know just off the top of your head when the Ottoman Empire was finally dissolved? Yeah, World War I. That was, that was a little bit of time. But throughout that time, Israel was driven out of their homeland. They were scattered. They had no more home anymore. They had been led astray, which was prophesied by the Lord. Because he said that he wouldn't come back until what? Until a generation had been established, and then he promised that a generation shall not pass away before his return. God knew that Israel would be dispersed, and then that one day Israel would be given back their land, part of it, and that they would become a nation again. Well, during the Roman Empire and before the Ottoman Empire, you can make the argument that Israel was no longer a nation and a people. They were not known as Israel anymore. Read the New Testament. Go study it. Read me once where it names 
any part of where Jesus went as being part of Israel. You don't. You'll find the Sea of Galilee. You'll find Capernaum. You'll find Jerusalem. You'll find all of these cities, Bethany that he goes to. But they didn't refer to those places as part of Israel. That was part of what nowadays they just call Rome. That was part of Pilate's territory. They still had King Herod, but he was a king in name only. Right? They had stopped referring to it by the people and started referring to it by the location, by who was in charge. Now, for the most part, a lot of people that were in Jesus' day around that area were still Jews. But quickly, that would change. Because in 70 AD, there'd be this thing called a rebellion or an uprising, which Jesus taught against, by the way. And as a result, Rome would come in, destroy the temple again in 70 AD. And then the Jews would be scattered because they were considered dangerous. And when they were scattered, they had no home. They had a people, they had a place that they knew once belonged to them. But they were scattered to the four winds. How do you think so many of them ended up in Europe during World War II? Right? God blessed His people. They became successful wherever they went. But what are you saying, Brother Jordan? The seventh, he says, shall continue for a short space. Rome accomplished the job of driving his people out. The seventh king is going to cause them to rally back together in a short space. The one that hadn't come yet, right? It says that the seventh is not. It says, when he cometh, he must continue for a short space. He's not yet come. Rome was the sixth. Who's the seventh? I don't know who it is. But whoever the seventh is, it's going to drive the people of Israel to once again unify as a people. Why? So that the persecution of the time of Jacob's trouble can commence. It's going to be a rallying cry, a banner, if you will, may even be under subjection that Israel returns to Israel's land. That they're forced to quarantine all of the Jews in what we call Israel today. I don't know. But I know that there's going to be one for a short space. God gave them a time to accomplish a job. But then it says, verse number 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Why does the seventh continue for a short time? Because he's just setting the stage for the Antichrist. That's the last piece that God moves into place to begin the events of the eighth king, which is the Antichrist. He's the one that shall rally all the nations against Israel. He's the one that's going to pursue them in the wilderness. Not the seventh. The seventh has a purpose, and when he does it, the Antichrist is there to take over. But it says, he is the eighth and is of the seven. Not one of the seven. It says of the seven. Now, do you find it any mystery that the Antichrist, which we've heard called the beast, the beast has seven heads. There's seven kings. Six of them had already existed. One had been around, got wounded, and then comes back. Everybody marvels at him. Okay, you follow me here? Is it any mystery that the eighth king is of the seven, meaning he's one of them? Not one of the numbered seven, but he's one of their kind. You know why he's not one of the seven? Because all seven had the same mindset that he had. He's the body, and they were just the outward appearance, the faces, if you will, of his will. What's the will of the Antichrist? To destroy God's people. What if each one of the five kings before this and the sixth one 
that currently had dominion over them, what did they want to do? They wanted to defeat God's people. They wanted to keep them under heel. They wanted to bring judgment upon them. And if you think, well, the judgment of the Romans and being under the heel of the Romans wasn't so bad, tell that to the people that just 30, 40 years after Jesus left the scene, they tried to rebel against Rome. They hated the dominion. It was not an easy lifestyle. That's why Jesus offended so many people when he said, if a man compel thee to go with him a mile, go with him twain. They hated the Romans. Jesus says, no, love them, go above and beyond. Do double what they ask. Double your required to show that you're different than anybody else. That you're one of God's people. Well, this eighth, why is he of them? Because he's the one that brought about the mindset in each and every one of them. Go back and look at Nebuchadnezzar. What was his mindset? Destroy everybody else, make himself up into a god. We're going to skip ahead a little bit, but what was the mindset of the Greeks? The Greeks were all about knowledge. They believed that they could learn enough to the point where they can make themselves gods. That's where the idea of humanism comes from. That's basis in Greek philosophy. And who were the Romans? The Romans were, we're going to conquer everything and live as gods. Romans were wicked. Go and study all the things that were commonplace in Roman society. Looks a whole lot like America today. But we're going to be who we're going to be, and if you say anything about it, we're going to crucify you. We're going to send you to the Isle of Patmos. We're going to turn you into slaves if you don't agree with the way that we believe that we can live. Why? Because they saw themselves as gods. And that wasn't just some people. That was from the top down. Look at Nero, who was Caesar in Jesus' day and in Paul's day. One of the most wicked and vile men to ever live. And I don't say that lightly. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying everything about the six and the one that's coming had one mindset. What was that? It was anti-God, anti-Christ. And what was it? It was pro-man, which as a result is pro-sin. The eighth, where do you think he's been working for all these years? He's been working from the shadows. Where does he manifest from? The bottomless pit. The Antichrist comes out of hell. If you study it, these seven kings, where do they come from? They come from the waters that the woman is sitting on. Right? They're elevated out of mankind. They're appointed for a time and for a space and for a job. The eighth one, the beast, where does he come from? He comes from hell. He's of them, but he's not one of the seven. He's the eighth. Really, it'd be more accurate to say that they are of him. Birth from the mindset that he started all the way back in the garden. Well, if we continue down to verse number 12, it says, The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. Anybody that tells you that these are ten kings in history, they're liars. It says that the ten horns that are on the beast are seven kings that have received no power as of yet. Go read the book of Daniel. There are ten nations that during the time of Jacob's trouble will be given authority. Some of them may exist societally right now, but they're not, they don't exist in the capacity that they will once the Antichrist shows up. Hang on. Ten horns, which thou sawest, are ten kings, which have received no power as yet, but receive powers as kings one hour with the beast. When do they become kings? Well, they may be great and they may be mighty even now. But there's going to be one 
that comes along and for a time, an hour. Right, short space in the grand scheme of everything. But for an hour, he gives them power as kings. You remember when we went, if we go back a couple of chapters, where we were talking about the beast before, where it talks about those ten that have dominion upon the earth. Between those ten kingdoms, right? Nowadays, we don't think of them as kingdoms, right? Last time I checked, there's over 270-ish nations, depending on which day of the week it is and who's declared independence and hasn't declared independence and who won a battle and who, was, who hasn't won a battle. Right? All over the face of the earth, different people that identify as different nationalities or different tribes or different regions. Right? There's a big push now that countries that globally are known as the name that they were given by their conquerors should be you know, globally recognized as the name that the people themselves call themselves. Okay, got newsflash for you. India wasn't called India until Britain showed up and called it India. Right? All those places throughout Africa until Europe decided that they were going to colonize Africa, they weren't called the things that they're called. The people had a name for those places. So even with lines on a map, that truly doesn't encompass how many different societies there are, how many different cultures there are, how many different languages and regions there are. Right? We can't comprehend how many different dialects there are across the world. But when the beast comes, there's going to be ten that are given power to rule over what? The whole earth. That means that everybody's going to fall in line in one of ten camps. But when it says that these ten horns are kings that are not yet, but for an hour, for a little bit of time with the beast, they're going to be given power to what? To divide and unify the world. And then guess what the beast does? But it says, verse number 13, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. You know what they are? They're governors. The Antichrist, he's the autocrat. He's the one that has all the authority and all the power during the tribulation. But he deputizes ten people and calls them kings or rulers. And he divvies up the whole world into ten groups, and they have one job. He gives them power to unify so that they can come back after that hour, after that short time, and give all the people's allegiance and all of their power and loyalty back to the beast. Read it again. Verse number 13. These have one mind. They're all unified in their goal and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Well, in verse number 12, it says that the beast only gave them power. Well, they come back and they give strength and power. What's he do? He gives them the gifts that he possesses, that the prophet possesses. Right? What's that? To flatter the hearts of men. He gives them power out of the bottomless pit to go and deceive the entire world. That's the power that he gives unto them. What do they bring back? They bring back the strength of man. And they give it unto the beast. The beast cannot attempt to destroy Israel on his own and God's people. He knows he's not enough for the job. He knows that his job from the one that he serves, called the dragon, you remember him, Satan? Satan commissioned him to go out and he says, go get everybody on one team. And then once everybody's on one team, look at verse number 14. They shall make war with the lamb. So the beast gives power unto these ten kings to go out and to rule, to unify, and then they bring back and give power and strength to the beast. Meaning everybody says, whatever you want, that's what we're going to do. 
You say jump, we say how high. You say run, we're not going to stop until you say stop. They're completely bought into it, hook, line, and sinker, but until he had the allegiance of man, he had no strength of his own. He had power, but he did not have strength. Two very different things. So these kings come back and they give him power and strength. What is that strength? It's might, military might. The unified will of an entire world to do what? Kill God and God's people. To wipe his existence and his memory off the face of the earth. It says, they shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them. Does Israel overcome? No. You know what they do? They endure. That's why it says that those that endure until the end shall receive a crown. That's talking about God's people. It's talking about Israel. That's not saying, folks, we're already in heaven. We've already been through the judgment seat. We've already received our crowns and given them back to them. Well, those that endure, is that? It's Israel. It's the woman in the wilderness fleeing from the dragon. Well, if they don't overcome him, who overcomes them? The one that they waged war on. You know why soldiers die in war? Because two countries declared war on the other country. Nobody ever declared war on you. But in fact, you want to go back to the day that you got saved, the devil declared war on you. But that's a different story. In this world, no government's ever declared war on Brother Ed. Okay, just his name. That's who we're going to war with. Right? Nobody's declared war on you personally. Nations declare war on nations. And soldiers that die in battle, it's not because war was waged on them. It's because their nation was threatened. Their people were threatened. They went to war to defend those that could not fight. They went to war to eradicate something that they saw as a threat. They went to enforce the will of their people. Well, who does it say that the beast goes to war with? The lamb. He doesn't go to war with the woman. He doesn't go to war with Israel. He goes to war with Christ. Well, why are the people in the wilderness, why are they dying? Because they are a testament to the fact that the Lamb still exists. They have to be eradicated. The people do not overcome, the nation overcomes in a war. Some people are recognized for distinguished valor or distinguished acts of bravery, for sacrifices or wounds that they sustained. But nobody says that this person won the war. The nation won the war. Well, who is our nation? He's the one who purchases with his blood. He's the one who has all power. He's the one that with a single word could end the beast's existence. It says that the lamb overcomes the beast. Not the lamb's people, not the woman in the wilderness. There's nothing special about these people from Israel, the 144,000 in the wilderness. They possess no superhuman abilities to overcome the beast. They're flesh and blood, just like you and I. The only difference is they chose to believe the lamb rather to, than to believe the beast. And there's a whole bunch of other people all around the world that will refuse to bow down and cower before the beast. But they all suffer the same fate. What is that? War is waged on them. Because the testimony of their life is that the beast isn't all-powerful. The beast is not the one that they say he is. He's not God. Well, it says the Lamb shall overcome them. Why? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. 
and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. You know why you got saved? Because Jesus called your name one night. And the Holy Ghost came and convicted you. Y'all remember that no man comes unto the Father except I draw him? He called you to an audience with himself. You know why God chose them? Because God chose everyone. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But they weren't just called. They didn't just hear a cry. When they showed up, they found out that there was an envelope with their name on them. Their name on it. You know, it was inside salvation. God chose to save them on purpose. You didn't get saved because you happened to be in a church service where somebody else was supposed to hear the message of salvation and you just kind of tagged on to the end and said, hey, I'd like some of that too. No, no, no. When you got saved, it's because God chose you. He did it on purpose. But it says that His people are what? Faithful. Why? Because He commanded His people to be like Him. And is not His name faithful and true? So why wouldn't God's people be faithful? It's not one of the enumerated fruits of the Spirit, but faithfulness is something that God puts in you when He saves you. And if you grow it and cultivate it, you'll be as faithful as the Lord was. Well, how faithful was He? He was faithful unto death, even the death of the cross. Why can't the beast overcome these people? Because they're faithful. They're faithful to follow the Lord. Why does 144,000 survive in the wilderness? Because the Lamb leads them. Remember, we saw that the Lamb was with them, and the Lamb led them. Why did they survive? Because they listened to the Lamb. They were faithful. He said, go, they go. He says, stop, they stop. That doesn't change in the Great Tribulation. You know, those that are enumerate, or, or enumerated in the Scriptures as having great faith, you know why that is? Because they were the most Christ-like. They're our in sample. They're the ones who overcame much because they had much faith. Go read the Gospels. You know the people that get called out? Zacchaeus? You know who he was? He was a malnourished, short guy known for robbing people. But yet he's called out in the Scriptures. Why? Because Jesus says, I'm going to your house today. Why was Zacchaeus? Because of his faith... Right? Christ was able to do much for him. Well, how much did God do for him? He went and he gave all the money he stole back. I don't know how rich you need to be. Most of the time when people steal something, they get rid of it real quick. If somebody takes $20 out of your wallet, they're spending it quick. But Zacchaeus was a smart sucker because he was shaving off the top of people's taxes and he went and he made money off of it somehow. Why? Because it says that he went and he gave it all back. Maybe he knew it was wrong and he never spent any of it. I don't know. But after he met Jesus, he's different. And he was faithful to go back and to right all the wrongs that he had committed. You say, why is he caught out? Because he was faithful. What about that Syrophoenician woman? The one that Jesus called dog. Why was she called out in the scriptures? He said, I've not, he even told her, I've not come for you. It's not meat to give what belongs to the master's children to dogs. And she says, true, Lord. But every now and then we get some crumbs. Why was she called out, and not by name, just by an identity, but why was she included in the scriptures? Because Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like that in all of God's people. He tells her, to get up. her faith hath made her whole. With faith, you can do a whole lot. Well, how are you going to do a whole lot in the times leading up to the Great Tribulation? Brother Jordan, how are we going to do a whole lot down with Christ for the Caribbean? How are we going to do a whole lot in Florence, Kentucky? It's real easy. It takes a whole lot of faith. You know why the people that during the Great Tribulation, those 144,000 God's chosen. You know why they have much faith? Because they lost everything else, and it's all they got. 
They've lost homes. They've lost families. They've lost their own identities. They've lost any plans that they had for the future. You know what they have? The Lamb. You know what they have faith in? The Lamb. All they got left is believing that the Lamb is going to take care of them. And they use every last bit of them to what? Have faith. They endure through to the end with what? Faith. You know what it still takes in today's day and age? To find favor with God? To be used of God? For God to come in and do something in your life that you didn't think was possible? It takes faith. But it says in verse number 15, and he, talking about this, one of the seven angels is talking to John. It says, and he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest were where the whore, talking about the woman, mystery Babylon, sitting on top of the beast, right? The waters which thou sawest where the whore says, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. All those waters get what? Mixed together. Under her rule, under her influence, remember what is her influence? One of a global religion. Right? A unified, everybody on the same page, worldwide religion. And who does it collect under her feet? Well, they gather all the water together in one place, and what's it do? It starts mixing. Under ten different rulers that come back and give all of their authority to the eighth one, the beast. That's to rule and reign, not only over Israel, but all people on the earth. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, being the ten kings, that the beast gave a little bit of power to, these shall hate the whore. Oh, hang on a second. Brother Jordan, I thought you said that Mystery Babylon was the driving force was that ambition and all those that strive to see it accomplished for a universal church. It is. But these ten kings who are given power for an hour with the beast, you know why they hate the whore? Because the whore for thousands of years has been coming up with different stories about who's really in charge, about who is the right one to believe in. And then the beast shows up. And these ten kings get to looking at him and they say, we think that he's the one in charge and you've been wrong too many times. They hate this woman that put in the, the desire in man's heart for a unified one world religion. It says, and they hate her so much that they shall make her desolate and naked. What are they, they make an example out of her. Right? You don't get to just change with the wind on what you say and what you say you believe. You've got to be devout in order to be one of the beasts. You've got to take his mark in your hand or in your forehead. You've got to be willing to go out and to kill others to prove how faithful you are to the beast. Well, by the definition of a harlot, what do they do? They make do with whatever comes their way. To what? Live another day. They have no commitments. Right? That's why it's called fornication, because it happens outside of marriage. Outside of commitment. Well, what has she done? She's committed fornication with man and kings and rulers for thousands of years. What do they do? They make an example of her. First, they strip her of everything that she has. They make her desolate. Well, you remember at the beginning where it said that she had pearls and gold and garments that were very fine and scarlet and purple. What she have by the end of this chapter? Nothing. They take it all away. What do they do? They give it to the beast. But then it says, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Not only do they make an example out of her, they wipe her memory off the face of the earth. First it says they eat her, they devour her. They take what she had and they use it to give themselves strength. But then it says they burn her with fire. Then they wipe away all evidence that she ever existed.
Brother Jordan, is that going to happen to one religion? That's going to happen to all religions across the globe. But all those religions, you go ask any Catholic, what's their goal? To be universal. You go ask any Muslim what their goal is. It's to be universal. You ask any Hindu or any Buddhist or any Confucianist, What's their goal? To spread. You know what that desire to spread, you know where it comes from? Mystery Babylon. To go out and to conquer and to put your religion in the heart of other people. All of them have been guilty of what? Waging wars to take land, to spread their religion. That's why Islam hates the U.S. Because we won't bow down and cower the one called Allah. That we won't recognize that Muhammad was the divine prophet. They might be the most... Oh, what's the word I'm looking at here? Volatile of all the other religions, but there are people that hate you because you lift up the name Jesus. You know where that comes from? Mystery Babylon. That's her working with different kings throughout men's history to bring about what? Her own edification. She wants to be lifted up. That's the truth of Mystery Babylon. She wants to sit atop the beast, except what? The beast doesn't have a master except for the dragon. What's the beast do? He uses her for what she can give him. And then what's he do? He turns her over to the ten kings that he gave power to. To what? to absolutely wipe her off the history books of mankind. She had no alliances as she gained all of her wealth, and she won't find any help in the end when people come to take her wealth away. It says, For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill His will. You know why Mystery Babylon's destroyed? Because of all the wickedness that she has done to God's people throughout the years. Go back to the beginning of the chapter, you find that she has a cup filled with what? The blood of the saints and the followers of God. She's drunk off of that blood. Why does she ingest it so, one, willingly, and two, with such joy? Well, because if she can wipe away all existence of God on the face of the earth, then there's nobody to oppose her. She doesn't care what they call her. Maybe Mary maybe Shiva, maybe any of these other deities throughout the world. All she cares about is what? What they bring to her, the gold, the fine garments, the positions of power, all those pearls. But see, God hates her. And God's going to use those that follow the Antichrist to do what? Destroy her. Says to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast. See, Mystery Babylon thought she was a queen, but nope, she was just a forerunner. Just like the seven kings that came before that she fornicated with in order to spread her religion. But the eighth one shows up and she finds out, oh no, he wants to take where I'm sitting. And he goes, yep. And God allows it to happen and puts it in the heart of all of the people on the earth to agree that that woman needs to be destroyed. It says, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. What words? That those that follow the beast, as we've already heard, should be cast into the lake of fire. Verse number 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. that great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Well, I can only think of one religion where kings have bowed down to somebody else and submitted their power and their authority to it. That would be a place called the Vatican. Before that, they called it Rome. It's moved cities. But that woman... Right, commands kings to do what kings may not want to do. Go look up the history of the Holy Roman Empire. 
all the different emperors that they had. You know who gave each one of them a crown to put on their head and called them king? The church. Not God's church, the Catholic church. And all the divisions and all the wars that have happened because of those that broke off from them. You know why that is? Because the woman's greedy. She wants all she can get. And she'll kill anybody that disagrees with her. Sounds to me like she spilled a lot of the blood of the saints. But see, at the end of it all, Mystery Babylon will be dealt with. And then we're setting it right up for what comes after that. What's that? The lamb overcoming the beast. Where's that happen? Battle of Armageddon. We're getting closer to that. But next week, Lord willing, we'll get into chapter number 18. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.